Fear often takes on many guises. One comes in the form of gathering together things. You know that saying, the one with the most toys, cars, fabrics, etc. wins? Well, Mark asks a very important question in the following scripture. What will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? That fear is seemingly greatly misplaced. And now a reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their lives for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me, And of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father with holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, I just ask that you will open our hearts to the message that you have for each and every one of us today. And Lord, if it is within your will, I pray that you will use these meditations of my heart and these words of my mouth to those ends. Amen. Fear is something that I, all of us experience, all of us have uh, you know, seen within our lives. And I think we've all noticed that our fears change as time goes on. Uh, When I was young, uh, there's a story that my mother tells uh, when I was in elementary school. This was back when uh, they were starting to put computer labs in schools, and apparently I was terrified that the computers in the computer lab were going to explode. I, I don't remember this, but she found it very funny and still finds it very funny, and takes time to remind me of it every once in a while. Uh, and I, th- I think oftentimes us as child, children, we do have those kinds of unrational fears, those fears of under the, under the bed. Uh, but fear, it does change as we grow older. It, it does stick in our lives. And sometimes it still is irrational. Other times uh, it, it is very rational. Uh, for me, as I have grown older, uh, you know, I have found that I have had anxieties over everything from, uh, you know, what my future might be, uh, what uh, God has planned for me down the line, uh, to things such as, uh, you know, where is money going to be coming from, uh, you know, what, how am I going to be able to pay this bill, how am I going to be able to afford gas in my own car, all of these things are fears that I have experienced in my life, and many of you probably out there have experienced as well, have experienced and seen it kind of come up in your own lives. Our our passage today from Mark 8, 27 through 38, uh, it's a story uh, that has some kind of big moments within the gospel, and especially within the gospel of Mark. Uh, It has Peter's confession. Uh, Jesus asks this question to his disciples, you know, who are people saying that I am? And it's Peter alone who states boldly that Jesus is the Messiah. And that was a big deal. Uh, That was a claim that, uh, you know, nobody else at that time was making about Jesus. And the fact that Peter recognized that is something that was very impressive. Uh, In other Gospels, Jesus commends him for
for that statement as well. Uh, but Jesus, in this case, he does say, you know, to keep that a secret. And he begins to continue teaching, and then Peter jumps out immediately and doesn't seem to like the fact that he's teaching that he has, that Jesus is going to have to go and die. Uh, and, and he does the opposite of what he just previously did. He, uh, he speaks in sort of a rash manner and tries to correct Jesus. And then we get into this part where Jesus talks about carrying your cross and following him and having and the cost kind of of being a disciple of Jesus and what that means. Uh, there's a quote from Tertullian that as I was preparing for uh, this uh, service uh, that I think is very relevant. Uh, Tertullian, in reading this passage, he made the following kind of analysis. He said, your cross means your own anxieties and your sufferings in your own body, which itself is shaped in a way already like, like a cross. Now, there's a reason why Tertullian was bringing this up. Uh, he lived at a time that was closer to the time of the writing of the Gospels uh, than us ourselves. Uh, you know, he had a little bit of a better perspective than I think that sometimes we do on just how rough it was for the early church at that time. Uh, there was a lot for the early church to be afraid of. Uh, at that at that time because following Jesus is not like it is today in America uh, It's not like it is today in the West where it is largely accepted and supported and it's very safe And it, it's like part it's one of the parts of culture uh, Within uh, within kind of the Western world back then it was a dangerous thing to be a follower of Jesus uh, There are stories of course of martyrs uh, We have the story of Stephen within the in the Bible of his martyrdom But there are plenty of other stories of, of early saints who were brought out and killed because of their own faith. Uh, the apostles themselves, 11 of the 12, all meet their end by martyrdom in that way. Uh, there, they were forced at times to meet in places like catacombs. You can imagine, you know, instead of going to a nice church like what I am standing in today and uh, what I'm sure many of you have walked in today where you have these, this carpet and pews and air conditioning, thank the Lord for air conditioning, uh, they were going down and meeting in places like catacombs. They were meeting in places where the dead were buried. Were buried. Uh, you can imagine kind of the, the, the feeling uh, of, of kind of, uh, of, of kind of shame and even maybe fear that might have been creeping into people that they were having to have their worship services among where the dead were supposed to be resting. All of these things made it so that fear is something that the New Testament, many of the New Testament author, authors are uh, trying to spe either speak against or provide encouragement against uh, for those who are following. Uh, John, uh, he makes a contrast between fear and love. Paul warns us not to fall back into fear. He warned uh, this, you know, the first century church not to fall back into fear. Uh, there are plenty of encouragements, as I mentioned as well, against fear. Uh, much of the assurances in Paul's letters to these early churches of God's grace and of our future rewards, especially of that coming of God's kingdom, are mentioned to combat this element of fear. And the idea is, you know, that as long as we're focusing on heavenly things, we can meet whatever faith is coming at us and that we're expecting. In context of rejection and death as a cost of faith, uh, encouraging believers to have, to not have fear really does make a lot of sense. And we do know that this was a little bit of an issue, that there were times when uh, people who were believers, who were in the church, uh, you know, due to persecution, uh, did turn away, did, did you know, renounce their beliefs. Uh, there was controversy early in the church about this, about how these individuals were supposed to be handled. Uh, how uh, should they be welcomed back in with uh, open arms or should they, you know, be punished for that sort of decision? That was an actual debate that happened very early in our history of the church. Fear then for the early church was something that often led people to reject Christ in order to survive. While this didn't necessarily cost them their salvation, it did lead them into sin, and for that reason, it had to be spoken against. You had to have this strong take against us. Now, in the modern church, we too have our fears. We too have fears for following Christ now. It's not maybe uh, the fear of death, but there are still fears based on uncertainty. You know, we don't necessarily face that fear of death. We don't necessarily face that uh, rejection that the early church had to deal with when they were choosing to follow Jesus, but we do have fears about what is to be expected in the future of the church. 
you know, we see in our churches the drop in our in, uh, attendance. Uh, this is a common problem in Western churches today. Uh, it's something that there are tons of books and writings and all sorts of things, things about. In our own churches here in our cooperative parish, we have seen this happen. You know, I, in, in preaching and talking with all of you, uh, I have heard the stories of the days when the church was packed and how sad it is that now it, it isn't. And it, that causes a level of anxiety because uh, it causes questions about things of, uh, you know, of, of, you know, where are our resources going to come from? Uh, where will the money come for X? Or we are running a deficit. How are we going to overcome that? Those are all very common things. Uh, I truly believe that this fear is at the heart of many people saying things like the church is dying. I, I think, you know, especially when it is coming from the mouths of Christians, I, I think oftentimes we're kind of letting that fear occupy us and, and bring us to a, a statement uh, that simply is not true. Uh, now, there are fears about uh, the state of our ministries, fears about the nature of our ministries as well. Uh, will the folks, for instance, who are going down to feed the homeless every month, are they going to be okay? Spoilers, yes, yes we are. Uh, we've, we've never had an incident. We were always fine. Uh, but for us, uh, largely what this all is is about how we see things moving in a way that we do not like. And we feel powerless to stop it. While this doesn't necessarily stop uh, the church from working, it, it does and can inhibit it and place us in a less than ideal position to spread the gospel. But despite all of that, Christ can bear our fears. This, there is power in the work that Christ did on the cross, power that can transform ourselves and the world around us. Christ himself, of course, had his anxieties. Uh, I love the passage of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane because it's a place where we very rawly see uh, his fears and anxieties. He's asking God to take this cup from him. He's literally asking God to not die. That says fear and anxiety. That is a very human moment of Jesus. So we know he has experienced things like this, but we also know that he has bared those things and that he went and still died for us on that cross. So we, too, need to follow his example and do the same. We need to be willing to carry our fears and burdens to Jesus and let him, like Simon of Cyrene did for him when he was walking with the literal cross, let Jesus take that cross from us and carry it for us. We must only give them up so that they can no longer stand as a stumbling block for us. We must all carry these these fears to Calvary and set them at the feet and let him let us be freed from all this. We must pray unceasingly for the work of God to be done and allow ourselves to conform to his will in doing so that way we can find comfort in the arms of God. Uh, now, I want to encourage you all to kind of join in with something that we will be doing on Sunday as well. Uh, it's a little bit of an activity uh, it's a little bit different, so I'm going to give some instructions, and if you want to pause the video uh, and kind of get stuff set up and then uh, continue on, uh, uh, that, that would be great. I will uh, kind of end my sermon with a little bit of a prayer about this. Uh, but we are, we are doing this kind of activity to kind of symbolically set our fears at the feet of Jesus. Uh, and so what I want to do is encourage you all to go and get a bowl, uh, fill it with water, and then get a strip of paper. Uh, if it's paper that can dissolve, even better. Uh, and I want you to take some time to sit, sit think, reflect, uh, and write your fears on that piece of paper. Write down uh, fears that you have for your community, for your future, uh, for anything that you might be facing within your life. Uh, naming the fears in general does help us uh, to release those fears, to kind of understand what they are uh, and give them up to God. Uh, and by naming your fear, you are indeed offering it to God. Uh, you are then welcome to take this fear uh, and put it in that bowl of water and let go of that, those fears. As you watch it dissolve, it is sort of symbolically like you are giving those fears to God and he is washing it away. So I will now give you all a moment uh, to fill those, fill those out if you are willing. All right, welcome back. Uh, I am sure that you have written, uh, written down your fears, placed them in, placed them in that bowl. Uh, if, you have, if you have not, 
Uh, you know, if you can do so after the video if you really do want to, want to or just listen. Uh, but now I would like to invite you all to join me in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we bring these fears to your feet. We recognize that fear is, is a part of being a human, uh, but that it can at times get in the way of us pursuing you and pursuing the gospel and doing the work that you expect for you. So Lord, like the water dissolves this paper that we've written the, those fears on and takes it away and turns it uh, into kind of a, a mush that disappears. We just pray that you will take our fears fears, and bring them off of our shoulders and bear them on yours. In your name, amen.